I'm Dan Snow. Welcome to Voices of the First World War. In the years leading up to the centenary of the war, the last of those who actually experienced it have passed away. But the Imperial War Museums and the BBC had recorded interviews with many veterans to try to capture what it was like to actually be there. This series listens to those stories. It was to get one trench, two trenches. In fact, during six months, I may say that we have stayed on the same ground. And however, we have thousands of men who were killed for these few meters of ground. Is not silly? It was like a landscape in the moon. You could see, especially at night, in the dark, the light of the German guns and the light of the shell exploding. Various colors, blue, the red, the yellow, the orange, any kind, it looked like fireworks. Even after the terrible losses of 1915, the First World War only intensified. By its midway point, 100 years ago, both sides were desperate to break the deadlock and were pouring in armaments, raw materials and young men on an industrial scale never seen before. 1916 was a year of titanic fighting, the biggest battles to that point in history, with carnage to match. Their names are seared into our national stories. Jutland, the Somme, and for the French, the fiercest, longest and most infamous battle of the whole war, Verdun. Shells fell all over the place and there were hardly ground where a shell had not fell. And uh, the smell was uh, curious enough. After a while I realised what it came from. It was a sort of uh, a sweet smell and uh, acid too. And of course this was the smell of all the corpses. Verdun already occupied a special place in French hearts. For centuries, it had been a mighty bastion near the German frontier, its fate intimately linked with that of France itself. The Germans believed France would sacrifice every man they had to defend it. So they planned an offensive to bleed France white, turning Verdun into a storm of fire and steel from February 1916 onwards. Their aim, to inflict extraordinary casualties, and force a shattered France to sue for peace. And the bombardment began at twilight, and for 72 hours we had a bombardment which did not cease, except for a few minutes in the early hours of every morning. The noise was absolutely tremendous. It was snowing and very cold. Germany's preparations were immense. A trunk railway line running behind the German front line carried 1,300 munitions trains over seven weeks to supply the Germans at Verdun. On the opening day of the attack, they fired two million shells at French positions along an eight-mile front, but poor weather meant the bombardment was delayed until the 21st of February, so the French had time to prepare for the subsequent attack by the infantry. Officer Henri Lacorne was there. He, along with French veterans, Private Georges Pillier, and officers Karganoff and Fenetrier, were interviewed for the BBC Great War series in 1964. The trenches was full of soldiers waiting for the German assault. We, naturally, were very nervous. Verdun was surrounded on three sides by German soldiers. When the wind was in our favour, we could smell ether from the German soldiers, ether with which they were practically drunk in order to make the assault more effective. On our side, we were given brandy to pep us up. 
the key fort of Douaumont fell within three days. There was a single supply road for the French, which became known as the Voie Sacrée, or Sacred Way. Officer Fenetrier worked on the lorries carrying military personnel to and from the front. We had to run, of course, the Voie Sacrée of Verdun, going from Bar-le-Duc to Verdun. There was the single road going to Verdun, and day and night, without any stopping, there were lorries going on and coming back, going on with soldiers, bombs, food, and coming back. Every 14 seconds, a vehicle would pass on the sacred way, carrying supplies to the French front line. The French held the Germans off, but the battle of attrition ground on. Intense shelling continued, and conditions only worsened. Arriving in Verdun in May 16, after the big rush, we had a long way to walk to reach our trenches, which were in very bad conditions. They had been bombarded, and uh, many uh, dead soldiers had not been yet buried. We had to do it. We could hardly sleep. All my soldiers were sleeping in the mud because they were so tired, they couldn't do anything else. We had bombardment nearly every day, sometimes the whole day, sometimes the whole night. Our shelters were very poor. We couldn't expect to escape with that kind of shelter. We had just to creep in the mud and try to find a bomb hole not full with water, with rain. The Germans attacked uh, heavily every day and every night. Of course, we had to live on our reserve foods, biscuits and chocolate and corned beef and so on. The food supply came quite irregularly because we had to ask for volunteers to go in the mud under the bombardment to get our food. Sometimes some soup, some coffee could arrive if the men that had gone to fetch them were not killed on the way, uh, which was not often that they could go and come back without being killed. The attack was like this. Always early in the morning, we received an order to get up a good glass of coffee with rum, it was necessary to have some spirit, you know, because we knew that above the trench, just above, it was death, death by the bullets which were waiting for us. We had to keep quiet, a whistle order, and everybody ought to jump on the ladders. Sometimes we were obliged to push some soldiers who could not jump up. It was awful, an awful thing, you know. Summer came. The French and British assault on the Somme did pull some German resources away from Verdun. French General Pétain rotated his units in and out of the battle to ease the strain on them. The attacks continued, but it was stalemate. It was very hot in Verdun this summer, and I remember that one evening, besides other things, we had for supper salted herrings, which made us very thirsty, especially on account of the difficulty we had to obtain water. We were not provided with water, we were only provided with wine. The water we had to find out by, by ourselves, try to find a spring or uh, get water out of uh, a bomb hole. I remember the, for a while we had been taking water from a small uh, rivulet. And uh, one day, looking for a missing comrade, I went to the spring. The body of my comrade was in the spring. We were drinking the water all right. Our life was this. From the beginning of the day until the night, we were eating 
sometimes, and smoking, firing at the German. Sometimes we receive a few bombs, and that was the life. The main phase of the battle came to an end in September. The French retook Douaumont in late October, but troops were still fighting there into December. It became a matter of surviving and passing the time. All my soldiers were very much interested in detonators and the copper belts of guns with which they used to make rings using small tools to make the ring for their sweetheart or their wife or their sisters. And when the night came, uh, we went to uh, the front of Verdun. Uh, I had to uh, go in the tunnel of Tavan, which is a tunnel on the railway line from Verdun to Metz. Uh, in this tunnel were uh, lived about a thousand men. A thousand men had lived there for months. It was filthy, uh, smelly. Well, we had the impression we could cut the air with a knife. Uh, keep our, our guns clean, if possible. Just like we had in Champagne, we had rats to take company. What we, we were eager to know is how long we would stay. And we knew that uh, we would be relieved from Verdun when the casualties uh, would come to a certain percentage. I don't remember whether it was 50 or 60 percent of the uh, troops. And every uh, morning uh, when a runner could come to the lines, he was asked, well, what are the casualties today? And uh, it's rather cruel cool to think that we had to uh, hope uh, that uh, the quality would be heavy so that we could uh, leave this uh, hell. It was hell. It was really hell. The German plan failed. The battle had been almost as bloody for them as for the French. The French army had not been destroyed. Neither side had gained much ground, yet for the French, Verdun was a symbolic, sacred victory that lives on in myth, but whose scars also crisscross the landscape to this day. The soil still holds the legacy of the Battle of Verdun. Bodies, rusted rifles and toxic substances leaking from unexploded ordnance. Nine villages around Verdun were entirely destroyed. And though uninhabited, these ghost villages continued to exist as administrative entities, memorialised as having died for France. It's thought around 10 million shells remain in the ground, to be uncovered and cleared for centuries to come. We have just two or three hundred yards, no more. And we had thousands of men who were killed on account of these awful attacks without any result, any real result, you know. And now, on the top of the Mount of Lorette, you, you may see a cemetery which is large like a town. German and French.